The Lancet, and also Nature about the work they've done together with Google DeepMind. We now have a uh, presentation from uh, Pierce, and hopefully we can play that video. So it gives me great pleasure to, to welcome everybody to this panel discussion, which is part of a European Health Tech Innovation Week sponsored by Giant Health. So my name is Pierce Keane, and I'm a consultant ophthalmologist at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London. And I'm also an associate professor at the Institute of Ophthalmology at University College London. And I'm privileged to lead a multidisciplinary clinical research group that aims to develop and apply artificial intelligence in healthcare using ophthalmology as an exemplar. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, the other members of this panel. And so actually I'll let them do their own introductions. Let me hand over to Zhao. Zhao, would you like to kick things off? Sure, thanks. Um, so uh, I'm Xiao Liu. I'm an ophthalmologist by background based in Birmingham in the UK. And um, uh, my interests in AI are around clinical evaluation of AI. I'm interested in um, AI as tools that can improve patient outcomes. And so my work is mainly around how we generate that evidence, how we ensure that it's robust and that it's answering uh, true clinical needs. And I'm also interested about um, safety of um, AI algorithms on an ongoing basis after they're deployed as well. Thank you, Zhao. And Zhao, you led the recent, or jointly led the recent consort, uh, the AI extensions for consort and, and spirit for randomized clinical trials also. Yeah, that's right. And so, uh, yeah, jointly led that with um, Alistair Denniston um, and the Equator Network. So that's the first international um, guidelines for um, how to report clinical trial protocols and trial reports. And many of us on this panel have contributed to that um, and are in the working group. So yeah, thanks for flagging Great. that. Thanks, I, I couldn't resist because that was such amazing work, uh, Zhao. But uh, let me move to Melissa. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure, thank you. Uh, I'm Melissa McCradden. I am a clinical ethicist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. I'm also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and I teach empirical bioethics research. Um, so my role at the hospital is involved in clinical ethics consultation, in policy and education. My scholarship and research uh, focus is in the ethics of health AI, um, specifically focusing on issues of responsible evaluation, um, accountable decision-making with AI, and uh, algorithmic bias, as well as considerations regarding explainability and interpretability in AI. Wonderful. So I think you're the perfect person to have on the panel for a load of the questions that I've got lined up. Uh, so thank, thank you, Melissa. Maybe uh, Siegfried, coming from uh, California, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Pierce. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Siegfried Wagner. I'm a clinical research fellow and PhD student at University College London. But uh, like Xiao, I'm an ophthalmologist by background at Moorfields Eye Hospital. Um, my research interests are mainly in furthering the understanding of how, the, uh, how uh, our eye represents signs of systemic disease. So how can we use features of the eye, such as pictures of the back of the eye, to actually predict uh, systemic conditions like dementia, heart attack, stroke. Uh, as well as that, um, or through that experience, I have... Uh, worked a lot on the clinical governance side of artificial intelligence, and that could be from the legal arrangements to information governance um, to actually the approvals that are required for conducting a, a clinical AI project within the UK. And something that we might also get into is the importance of data linkage. So the UK uh, benefits from a lot of large data repositories, and over the last three years, I've been a lot of experience in bridging many of those data sets. Awesome. Thank, thank you, Siegfried. Um, Maybe to Chris uh, Kelly next. Thanks, Pierce. Hi, I'm Chris Kelly. I'm a clinician in the medical imaging group um, at Google, uh, previously DeepMind. And I work on a number of imaging projects, uh, pretty many taking, taking ideas from like our early research phase towards real world impact. Nice to be here. Thanks, Chris. And last but not least, Ivan, would you like to tell us about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, Pierce. Uh, my name is Ivan Beckley. I'm a final year medical student at UCL. Um, I also, while studying, spent time 
doing a master's in data science. And so that was in partnership with the DeepMind team um, and the healthcare team where I worked on looking at application of AI in the world. Um, and on the back of some of that work, I've also had the privilege of doing some work um, with the Audible team that we published um, a podcast where we identified bias in medicine and the problems that can arise when we don't address existing and pre-existing notions of what um, health and well-being is amongst different individuals. And so um, I'm really um, happy and for a privilege to be a part of this discussion. Look forward to all the questions. Yeah, so I mean, it's great to be amongst such great friends and collaborators and looking forward to the discussion, but maybe, maybe I'll kick things off with the question to Chris. So we've called this panel discussion, artificial medical intelligence, hype or hope. And so my question is, okay, I think we're all agreed that AI has the potential to, trans to transform healthcare, but what are some of the biggest challenges in actually bringing artificial intelligence into the real world in a clinical setting? Yeah, I think it's the, it's the big question because um, so AI has huge promise. And I think we're all here because we all see a lot of excitement and potential. And it's almost certain that in 20 years time, it will be ubiquitous in the world. And I'm quite excited for the potential that has to you know, democratize specialists opinion around the world, um, improve workflows, improve accuracy, improve um, consistency of care. But the challenge is such a huge challenge getting it actually into the real world. Writing a paper is one thing, but actually having a, a sort of um, intervention that's deployed in the real world uh, is a real challenge. And some of the Zhao's work with the Spirit and Consult guidelines is really, really trying to get to the core of you know, what, are the, what are the things that we really uh, care about when we're trying to deploy these things. And I guess um, there are things, you know, adoption by clinicians. Um, the clinicians are naturally, you know, they want high quality evidence, um, evidence of real world deployment. Um, a retrospective study in a lab setting isn't quite, isn't everything. You know, how, how will it change the workflow when it gets there? What, what unforeseen consequences will there be? These are like really nuanced challenges actually. Um, and then in terms of machine learning, um, these, these models are quite, um, they're less uh, robust than a human. So a human is very, you, know, you can put a human in different environments and the human will adapt accordingly. Um, you can take a, an A&E doctor from London and put them in Ghana and quickly they'll, they'll learn what the new distribution of the population is and they'll know that maybe it's more likely to be an infectious disease rather than you know, influenza or something. Um, so generalization, I think, is a huge problem um, and the robustness of these algorithms. How does it know what it doesn't know? And with that comes fairness. You know, how, how do you know when the algorithm, it, you know, how, there, there are always going to be subgroups that maybe the algorithm doesn't perform that well on. And you only find out those things when you um, dig into it in really careful details. That's again, something that um, Zhao has been working on, I know. Um, and then the human factors, how do algorithms fit in? Um, you know, how, do, how do algorithms work with humans? How do the humans re relate when they see a, a response? It's, these are all like fascinating challenges. I mean, there are more, there's logistical, regulatory, privacy. There are basically many, many challenges. And I think that's why we only see one or two examples in the real world at the moment. And so, I'm sure so we'll, see, we'll see more over time. So, so we're in the early stages and maybe what you're suggesting is that like our children will look back on this time and suggest that this was like looking at black and like silent movies or stuff like that, or um, the early motor cars or, or, or something like that. I think so. I, I, I imagine in the future we'll look back and go, gosh, you know, it's really hard to imagine where we are now because at the moment it's very hard to see the way forward for a lot of a lot of these technologies. But I think looking back, it will seem so obvious. But so what's really exciting, I think, for us and you know, on this call and listening is is like being part of that journey and, and thinking about all the different ways in which we can um, make the translation of these algorithms into the real world sort of safe and fair and maximize its performance. So, so, so publishing a paper in Nature is only one tiny part of this much larger spectrum. And of course, Chris, you've published a few papers in, in Nature or similar journals at this point. But um, so just to bracket some of the things you talked about, I mean, to me, there's questions around um, the clinical validity, the clinical valid validity of these algorithms, and that's something Zhao has explored a lot. Um, uh, there's something about the technical maturity of these algorithms. There's something about actually implementation in the real world. But even before that, there's something about are these. There's something more basic around are these algorithms robust? Are they generalizable? Are they reliable? Are they safe? Are they fair? 
And I wonder, Melissa, would you have any comments around making sure that these algorithms are fair and making sure that these, these systems are safe? Yeah, that's certainly a, a complex topic. Um, and I think uh, that in, in a way, even the word, the term algorithmic fairness sort of misattributes the fairness issue, because really what we're talking about when we see unfairness in algorithms, what it's generally reflecting, what we're usually talking about is some sort of structural or systemic pattern of unfairness that relates mm -hmm. to you know, the persistence of some historical practices, the persistence of socialization patterns that make healthcare um, delivered differently for different people. And all of us, you know, we're in different contexts in terms of even our model of healthcare delivery, so single payer versus private, um, and all of those things affect um, how the patterns get mapped into machine learning. And so we often kind of think about the, the goal of machine learning really, I think in its ideal would be to have identified a substrate of a medical phenomenon and to map it objectively. Um, but in fact, what we see is that there's so many ways in which these extant factors permeate into those patterns. Um, and so it makes it really difficult to try and figure out what exactly is the fair part of this and what is the unfair part um, and something that I've been thinking about a little bit lately, too, in terms of that issue of algorithmic fairness, because a lot of what, we're, what we look at is trying to make sure that a model is accurate equally on all populations. Um, and so sometimes, you know, if we think about that, I wonder actually if accuracy is the necessarily the thing that we always want to be maximizing, because you could have a perfectly accurate system that maps a pattern that is unequivocally unfair. And so I think that actually the next step toward making healthcare, which is augmented by AI, actually more fair and equitable might be a move away from accuracy and might be more toward trying to ensure that all individuals are treated equally and that where there are um, discrepancies in performance in AI, um, what might actually be the root cause of them not seeing the ideal pattern that we're really hoping for. And, and so, Melissa, are there any particular examples that you might think of in, in recent years of algorithm of algorithm bias that have been particularly kind of egregious? Yeah, so Ziad Obermeyer's work, I think, is probably the most influential in this space looking at this. Um, and he's got a couple of papers really worth digging into. Um, the first was one in Science in October 2019, which showed that a very commonly used algorithm that allocated uh, patients into a complex care management program. Um, the researchers found that patients who are black were twice as sick as patients who are white when they were automatically referred. Um, and the important thing about that is that initially the algorithm developers um, removed patient race from their database because they didn't wanna be affected by racial bias. Um, and so Ruha Benjamin, who is a scholar at Princeton, who's done a lot of work in this area, has pointed out that actually where we tend to get into the most trouble is when we believe that we've created a system that is objective and neutral. That's usually where we get into trouble because she looked at, you know, this was predicated on cost as a proxy of healthcare need. And in fact, recognizing larger systemic patterns in how black and white patients have access to healthcare. This is a problem that would have been fairly obvious to some people outside of that context. Um, and so the Ziad's team actually found that if you operationalize the model in a different way, um, so instead of having cost as a proxy for need, if you were looking at number of comorbid conditions, number of visits, um, things like that, you could actually have a much more even referral pattern. And I think one of his more recent paper, which I thought was particularly inspiring, was actually looking at uh, knee pain, um, images of patients' knees who are presenting with knee pain and looking at the correlation with patient reported levels of pain. And so again, he had noted that historically, um, you know, medicine has noted that patients who are black tend to report higher levels of pain, and we don't have a good reason why that is. And so when you actually look at the current tools for evaluating that, um, it's been found that they are not quite mapping onto what Ziad observed from the original images themselves. And so I think not only is that an opportunity to sort of say, well, actually are the current tools that we have really all that fair to begin with? Like maybe we should be doing this in a different way. 
And so I think, you know, what's really interesting about it is the way that we use these empirical demonstrations of patterns that we see and use them to question some of the larger practices that are relevant, linking up interdisciplinary work, you know, with people who study intersections of race and medicine, gender and medicine, people who study ethics um, from the perspectives of people who are typically underrepresented um, in the field. And so I think it's, it's really opened up a really important and much overdue conversation. Thank you, Melissa. I wonder, does anyone else have any comments on, on that topic? Yeah, if, if, if I could, Pierce, I think this mm. is a um, really important topic around, you know, how do we, um, I think for me, use AI as an opportunity to correct some of the mistakes that we've had in medicine for a while. Uh, and the topic on bias, I think is a really important one. Um, a lot of those, this, stuff that I've looked into um, was for me in kind of being someone of color and, you know, growing and training to be a doctor was, was really shocking to understand mm. how um, a lot of the, the norms that we have accepted and that I've been trained, we all have been trained on, um, are, have been predicated on kind of biases that were common and the norm in society. And so we have foundations of medicine that were based on people who had ideals and um, ideations around people um, who are other to kind of the norm um, and that has created therefore medicine to inherently have biases and what was fascinating in the work that I was doing and I think Zayud's studies was one of the best on that like Melissa mentioned um, was actually there's an opportunity for, for AI to correct some of these mistakes if it uses the right inputs and measures the right outcome in order to do so and so as someone who is very idealist in the nature of what we can do in the world, I think is an exciting opportunity for those who are building, for those who are thinking about why AI, why now, what's the opportunity? I think the biggest opportunity from what I can see is actually use it to create a future that is much better for everyone than the current kind of present. And um, so that's, that's kind of what I would add to that. Well, <clears throat> so, I mean, I think it's clear to me that um, this is such an important issue but it's it's um, it's such a fundamental issue to current machine learning approaches, which is that they essentially do well when they're tested on data that's similar to the distribution of their training data, and they tend to do poorly when it is different. And like one of one of my a common question that you'll get at conferences is oh, would, would your AI system work on this other device or in this other disease or in this other patient population? And my answer is always almost certainly no, probably not, uh, unless it's sort of retrained or, or re-optimized for that new data. Um, so we've, we've touched on some of the challenges in um, you know, bringing AI into healthcare. And Chris has talked about some of the implementation challenges and Melissa and uh, Ivan have talked about some of the issues around algorithmic bias and fairness. And um, I think one of the other issues that is really important around the, uh, the development of these systems is the fact that we are often using routinely collected patient data to develop these models. And so I wonder, Sigrid, if you could touch a little bit on some of the challenges that we have in terms of um, aggregating and curating these data sets, and are there any potential solutions that are uh, beginning to emerge on the horizon? Yeah, thanks, Pierce. I mean, as you say, there have been really two major strands to most deep learning research or AI research, which is that some studies have used these prospective cohort studies, so big ones like UK Biobank, for example, where a healthy population is recruited, and then you have lots and lots of imaging, blood tests, lots of data collected on essentially a healthy um, uh, population-based study. But then, as you say, you've got a growing number of, of research on real-world uh, data, and you know this is something that uh, at UCL Moorfields we do a lot of in particular. Um, and that has its own challenges. I mean, firstly, the, the data is obviously, there's a huge selection bias in this data that this is the hospital attending population. So when we look at um, developing, for example, population screening tools on data and more fields, it's a real challenge because most of these patients have eye disease. Whereas if you look at the, the general population, that's not the case. Um, 
The other challenge that comes, which you alluded to with real world data is, is, is essentially centralizing different data sets. So for example, the UK is, is, is fortunate in that it benefits from the National Health Service, uh, which, which means that data on, for example, hospital admissions does end up getting centralized by a body like NHS Digital. And there might be situations where you want to use that data, some of your data labels. But actually having it in one centralized pace has all kinds of implications. I mean, it's not computationally very efficient. There are all kinds of ethical issues which having it centralized, for example, what if that data was to be, to be acquired by a single center, a single NHS trust? And then you have to look at other, uh, other approaches for this. So people are developing those things like federated learning, uh, for example, to overcome those issues. So, I mean, how do you feel about the prospects for this? Because do you think that the 2020s are the decade where we finally get our act together and connect health data? I mean, we're doing this call on Zoom in different locations, different countries, but yet we can't share uh, data very easily sometimes between a family doctor and a hospital. Yeah, so we're seeing huge, I mean, I mean, COVID has obviously been a huge catalyst for a lot of that. I mean, we've seen some really big work from the British Heart Foundation and NHS Digital, where they've actually managed to link in the UK for what, 57 million patients. They've managed to link pharmacy records, primary care records, secondary care records, audits, national audit data into one centralized uh, trusted research environment. And that's incredible in many ways. Um, uh, but of course, that has its challenges, as we were talking about before, and it might be that in the next 10, 20 years, actually, especially as we go to, we evolve into a more global setting, we think about federated learning approaches, um, uh, where essentially the data does not leave uh, its, its, its source of collection. Um, maybe to give an explicit example, you know, you could imagine that data stays within each NHS trust in the UK. Um, and actually the, the models that you're developing, they are instead delivered to these individual centers. They are updated on those local data sets. And then just that processed model update is actually centralized in a way. And there are many potential advantages to that. I mean, it's more efficient because you don't need to move lots of data. I mean, certainly from the data privacy and the ethical point of view, it's much more robust because there's no inappropriate flow of information. Um, but also you just, you're just generating better models. We were talking, talking earlier about robustness or generalizability. We might develop a model at Moorfields, which is you know, the largest eye hospital in Europe. Uh, and that might seem, oh, well, bigger is better. But actually, when you deploy that model in a setting in the north of England, where 99% of the population is Caucasian, for example, and 50% of people who have severe diabetic eye disease in Moorfields are actually South Asian. Well, you can imagine that that model is not going to perform particularly well when it's deployed in that setting. And federated learning might actually be a solution in that. You have a large global model, and that can be tailored to individual centers, depending on that particular population. So, so I guess the challenges that we face are really interconnected then. And maybe, as I say, I mean, I feel optimistic that the, the, the 2020s is the decade that when you figure it, that we will figure this out. So I, I imagine a situation in 2030, where we look back, and, you know, I talk to like the, the medical students and like bore them to death talking about studies where uh, I did a study of AMD with 200 patients and it was the biggest uh, of macular degeneration with 200 patients and it was the biggest of its kind in the world. And they're just like rolling their eyes because they're doing studies with every single patient with macular degeneration data from those patients around the world in, in, in a given time period. So I'm, I, I mean, I'm an optimist, as you can probably tell. I think we're going to crack it in the coming years. But even if we do crack it, we still face other challenges. And one of the other biggest challenges is around regulatory approvals for these systems. And maybe, Zhao, we can turn to you. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts about where things stand with regulatory approvals for clinical AI systems at the moment? And how do you see that evolving in the coming years? Um, well, there's a lot of work going on at the moment reviewing the uh, regulatory frameworks that govern AI within software as medical device. And um, I mean, I'm not a regula regulatory 
third by any means, but um, have a keen interest in all things safety within AI. So, mm. um, so you know, um, I think in terms of what we'll see in the next few years, well, much of the regulatory requirements that are already in place for software still hold for AI. Mm. Um, that and so we don't need to reinvent the wheel and you know we see this across the board everybody's like oh it's ai we need to change everything and start from scratch and then you look into it and you're like well actually this 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 you know 90 percent of what we already have in place already applies and is robust and um at least you know in principle and the same goes for the regulatory requirements the execution so, of that yeah. is a separate issue no, I was just going to say, I mean, to, to, collect, to just build on that point, to me, it's, um, you know, we, tr we develop these AI systems in a certain way, we train them on data, but at some point at the moment, we just lock them and they just become like any other piece of software, for example. But do we, I mean, is there a possibility of machine learning AI systems that are actually, that we don't lock, that continue to evolve and train in real time as they're deployed? Yeah, so I mean, I think this is one of the unique advantages of AI, which doesn't fit into the current regulatory framework, right? Um, we kind of talk about the ability for AI algorithms to continuously update or continuously train on new data examples, and it's seen as a um, major advantage for AI over other software. It's also potentially a necessity to keep it safe, given that we know um, there are issues around generalizability for new data examples. So it's also can be thought of as a risk mitigation tool. Um, the current regulatory setup is not uh, perhaps agile enough to keep up with the pace at which software can be updated. And, um, and what we don't want to do is hold back innovation, hold back a tool that can potentially be a beneficial a development that can potentially be beneficial to patients and um, ensure that AI is safe because the regulatory um, processes can't keep up with it. So we're seeing lots of regulatory bodies um, review this. So the FDA published their action plan for AI in January this year. Within that, there's a big element around predetermined uh, change control plans, um, which starts to get us thinking about um, pre-empting uh, what changes you might make to your AI as a software and then how to do that safely and to have procedures in place to mitigate potential risks that, are, that can come out of that. And so we might see elements of that coming through um, the exist sort of on top of the existing frameworks for software as medical device. So, I mean, it certainly seems a challenging topic because we have these continuously learning machine learning algorithms in, you know, when we buy stuff online or when we listen to music online and things like that. But it seems like a, many orders of magnitude more complex to contemplate that in a in a healthcare setting, uh, for example. Maybe I'll pass yes, on. Can I just make a comment sure, on that, yeah, actually? Yeah, yeah. The comment just being that, you know, an interesting thing is that when we talk about AI, we're talking mainly in healthcare about diagnostic or prognostic models, but we've been mm. using prognostic models for a long time in healthcare. Mm. You know, anytime someone goes in with possibly having a, a swollen leg, a deep vein thrombosis, a prognostic mm. model is often used unless you're certain of what it is. And yet actually this whole emergence of AI is formalizing that framework for updating these models. These models are often not updated or even audited for that purpose. I've, I've certainly tried to look into that. Um, and so this is, this, this is actually introducing a structure that has probably long been needed um, mm. on generally clinical prediction models. I mean, I can't help but just think about the fact that I listen to Spotify and I get certain recommendations based on the music that I listen to. And then my, my daughter, puts on like a frozen soundtrack continuously for like two days and suddenly like my recommendations are screwed up of continuous learning in, in, in healthcare. Anyway, with that note, maybe we'll, we'll move on. I, I, Ivan, I can't resist at just uh, sort of taking a slight detour to ask you a little bit about your uh, personal story because I'm just intrigued by your introduction 
you know, final year medical student at UCL, you know, worked at DeepMind uh, in da data science and now founder of your own company. So you're someone who's really having to deal with all of these challenges around implementation of um, digital technologies. And I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, uh, about your story? Yeah, I mean, I recognized very early that I'm, I, I wasn't a typical medical student um, because I was running around thinking and trying things that others weren't trying. And so, yeah, my journey was going through medical school and just being um, annoyed with just how things were and how little was being done to change them. And so my story is a story of someone that was a bit restless and wanted to kind of find ways of doing things in a different way. I think to the point on implementation, I think what's interesting is because I almost kind of went through the whole journey, kind of testing, trying and doing things as I was learning medicine, I kind of, I realized, and I realized this when I was speaking to a consultant around some of the work I was doing, the lens with which I was seeing opportunity was very different to, to how he was seeing opportunity. He saw opportunity as something to be worried about, something that we should be um, um, kind of apprehensive about, whereas I looked at it as an opportunity to advance what we were doing and to really push the boundaries because, you know, I was learning as I was kind of almost innovating in so many sense. Innovating mm -hmm. is a very loaded term, um, but I, I think, like, that opportunity, I think, is open to anyone who is walking into medicine the field from all angles. You know, I think we're at a stage where there are new tools, platforms, um, opportunities to extend. Okay, so we've had to cut that at the end um, because we're now going live to our panel discussion. So this is where we have to uh, keep our fingers crossed that all the tech works. <laughs> we've got John Wilkes in London, who's going to arrange a panel discussion with various people uh, around the UK and abroad, and also Tony Kiprios, who's from here, uh, who's worked for the uh, UNDP uh, on innovation, is going to be joining them from this event hall. So, can we go live to see if this is all going to work miraculously?